Welcome to... Whoa, that was loud. Holy smokes. How loud was that, Dolan? The same you just loudness lines. <clears throat> that I, I had it before you started. I don't understand why that was so loud. <laughs> because you start off every episode... Yelling? 10 decibels higher <laughs> than... <laughs> than the normal pace line. This is how it happens. I turn it down to so between 6 and 7 at the beginning <laughs> of the episode. And then about a minute in, I go up to 8. <laughs> Like, welcome to another episode. I'm just excited. I'm excited. I, 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 I get excited. I don't blame you. All, All right. right. Now I'm ready. Action. Take two. Welcome. Was that better? Welcome. That was good. Welcome to another episode of A Beer with Atlas. I'm Rich. I'm Brian. <laughs> <laughs> I got excited. Sorry. I got excited that time. Inspired by the adventures of our nurses, therapists, and techs. A Beer with Atlas is the only healthcare traveling, craft beer drinking podcast. Each week, we'll open a few beers, talk about the brewery and the style of beer, and then dive into some research curated specifically for each episode. In the end, we hope each one sounds like a conversation you'd have with your friends while enjoying a few cold ones. I'm excited this week because we have our first collab. This yeah. is our first beer. So in the brewery world, yeah, they're cool and, and they don't say collaboration. No, that, that's that too, takes too many letters, too many syllables. I don't have time to say collaboration. They say collab. Yeah. So the first collab to start. Uh, we're we're a couple weeks into January already. Thought we haven't done this yet. And friend of the show Sheila Bissell brought us a collab between Oliphant Brewing and East Lake Brewery and Tap Room. It's called Ancient Psychic Tandem War Elephant. That's a lot of words. It's a lot. Say that again. Ancient Psychic Tandem War Elephant. Wow. I think they should have just called it collab. Here's the best part. This is what it is. Because normally collabs are kind of boring, right? They do an IPA or they do something. Yeah. Yeah, it's something. Okay. It, these guys are crazy, and I think as we get into the Oliphant a little bit, like those guys are fun. These guys, they're they're kind of yeah. crazy there. Yeah. Uh, I think they'll be happy with that description. I, I hope, hope so. I hope so. We'll find out. Uh, this is a smoked sea salt goza brewed with guajarlo. Guajarlo. Let me see it. Okay, here we go. Guajarlo. Peppers? Are you trying to say a pepper? It's a chili. Guajillo. Guajillo? You're Guajillo close. chiles. Chiles. And what else? What else is in there? And Oh. Cacao nibs. 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 Of cacao. Not cacao. the nibs that like the that you would get in the store. Yeah, not those. Not those nibs. Those are okay, but not as good as a cacao nib. This is really, really cold. I'm going to hand it back to you. It is cold. And it's also a really weird combination. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Oh, so I wonder good. if it's going to be smoky. I hope so. I want to see smoke come out of that thing as you open it. No. Nope. Well, sea salt is always in a goza, right? Is that what makes it a well, goza? Or is it just salt? It doesn't have to be sea salt. It's got good color to it. Yeah, it does. It, it's generally salt. Uh, yeah, I mean, sea salt, yes. So what I'm expecting more of is then the smoke. Mm. I want to I wanna taste the smoke. I don't know. I hope it's crazy weird. <laughs> it looks very... Um, <clears throat> It looks very normal colored. I, is normal color a word? I mean, is that a, sure. is that a way to describe yeah. beer? Normal color. Yeah, it looks, it's very bubbly. Super carbonated. Like, almost like a cider, it looks mm. like to me. Mm. It smells like a goza. Right? Yeah. It smells like exactly oh, yeah. what I thought it a goza was. It smells like yep. fruity and salty. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know what that actually sounds like when you're listening to it? Oh, I know radio? what it sounds like. Yeah, exactly. Our friends in Colorado know what that sounds like. Oh. Yeah. Dolan. <clears throat> well, sounds like what Dolan do you think? Good thing this is audio and not video, right? <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about that? I really, really like it huh. a lot. The smoke is up front. Yep. The peppers are up front, but not spicy, just the taste of like a pepper skin. It's like... Um, the fruit hits and then the smoke comes back. So have you ever had guajillo chiles? Like uh, No. So correct me if I'm wrong. I'm pretty sure it's the the dried chilies in a bag that you see in the produce aisle of most grocery stores. There, well, those are there's a bunch of different ones, but sure, that's how they come usually, and it reminds me of that smell. Hmm, hmm. that could be right. How do you spell it again? G. Let's see. Hang on. I'm gonna I'm gonna use ask the Google machine here. G U A 
J I L L O. I L L O. Yes, that's how you, <laughs> this is. You pass that spelling test. Don't riveting you? content here as I Google things. We'll put in a little Google music. Mm. A <laughs> Guajillo chili or Guajillo chile. Get yeah. it? See? Yeah. Oh yeah. Mm. Is the dried form of the yeah. oh, Mirasol? Yes. Mirasol chili, a landris land race land race. It's actually land race, but it's all one word. Okay. Landris. Mm. Variety of chili pepper from the species Cap- Capsium anum. Oh, boy. And so, in Anaheim. Oh, an Anaheim chili. Okay. And is the second most commonly used dried chili in Mexico after poblanos. For salsas. Mole. For, mm. oh, for salsas. Mole. Well, I mean, you can, I guess. Mm. Oh, do you know what the... Okay. So, what is the dried version of poblano called? Do you know this? No. Ancho. 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 Yeah, I've seen it. I've heard it. of this before, yeah. yeah. I've seen it, but I never knew that those were just dried poblanos. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, if you look at the picture, it's exactly what you think it would be. It's yep. The, yep. yep. What, what it looks like in the shell. store. You know what I have? Uh, <clears throat> I got a Christmas ornament in Albuquerque, New Mexico, about five years ago. And it's just a pepper like that. It's really long. It's just, it's hollowed out. There's nothing in it. And it just has... I think it says Albuquerque on it. They yeah. like paint, painted it, and it's got a nice thing and hanging up on the on the Christmas tree. But it's a real pepper. Oh, but it's like oh. six years old now. To like shellac it or something. So it, yeah, you have to be a little gentle with it. You oh, know? sure. You wonder if, I wonder know. if it's um, Albuquerque. I wonder if it's a uh, like a ha- a ha- a hatch. Mm. Well, I don't know why that was so hard to say. Um, it's red, mm. and it's long. Red and long. Aren't yeah. hatch chilies green and well, roundish? I don't know. What are those? I don't know what those are. Aren't those? Those came from Albuquerque. Isn't there different like hatch chilies? There's, Maybe. I don't know. Let us know. It looks like a pine yeah. cone, but it's chilies. Hmm. Speaking of chilies, mm-hmm. that's pretty good beer. It's, <laughs> okay, it's as weird as I wanted it to yeah, be. Yeah, it's salty up front. The, the smoke is nice. Mm-hmm. You definitely get it, but it's not overpowering. It doesn't feel like I smoked a cigar right, or anything. Mm. But yeah, that's a combination I've never had before. It's good. wonder what, what would that go good with? Chips and cheese dip? Is it too sweet? It's a little sweet for that. I don't know. Maybe a dessert? <clears throat> Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. It's, got, it's got a strange combination of stuff going on. That's... Mm. Flan. Flan. Go good with flan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I guess. I right. mean, I mean, you get the sweetness of the flan to cut the sour? I don't know. Maybe. So I'm looking for it here on the untap because I'm just curious about the bitterness, about the... The IBUs or mm-hmm. what? Okay. They're not the first one to use war elephant, though. There's a number of war elephants. Yes, there were. I, I had some trouble with that on the internet. Hmm. I wonder if you search by ancient psychic tandem. The uh, the, 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 the clatter you hear in here is uh, uh, Hannah Bryant. Oh. Host of Wino Wednesday, who's cleaning yeah. up her stuff. No, nobody wants your <laughs> leftover teriyaki chicken. Well, let's see how many. After a couple of these beers, we might. Okay, there we just go. Just leave it. Yeah, we'll we'll see what happens. So, thanks. Thank you, Hannah. Sorry, bye. Cameo. <laughs> Ancient. Oh, here hey. it is. Ancient psychic tandem war elephant. She left her drink, by the way. So oh, we'll drink that later. Yeah. yeah okay. <clears throat> Na for IBU. So there's no bitterness at all. Doesn't even register yeah. on the scale. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. 65 check-ins for this. I didn't want to get That's into this it? too quick. But yeah, 65. <laughs> so Sheila brought this back for us. I guess she had it at the brewery or whatever. Oh, and I'm wow. surprised she didn't say this was super... Maybe that's why she brought it for mm-hmm. us. Because she thought it was super weird. And she knows that we like weird stuff. She brought us a lot of stuff in this run. She always does. Yeah. She's pretty fantastic. Man, like that's, that. that's really good. Do you know who, really good. who her recruiter is? Um, Hannah? Who just interrupted oh, us. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. So Look at that. There you go. It was like meant to be. I guess so. Huh. All right. So here, I'll run down my research because I can't wait to hear which way you went with this. Right, yeah. Uh, so the collab. We'll start with uh, we'll start with East Lake first because they seem the most normal out of the two. Okay. Uh, East Lake Brewery and Tap Room. Not that there's anything wrong with normal. Uh, East Lake Brewery and Tap Room, 920 East Lake Street. Get it? East Lake, East Lake Street. Oh, man. It's oh, just right there. Super easy, right? Yeah. Minneapolis, Minnesota, seven days a week, uh, open noon to 11. Love that. That's that's pretty fantastic. Noon to 11. Noon to 11, seven days a week, even on Sundays. 
whatever. Get That's out of church, good. roll down to East Lake. Get there before kickoff. Yeah, have some more elephant. Uh, founded in 2014 by Ryan Pittman. He was a former Minneapolis city bus operator hmm. and thought, yeah, I'll brew some beer. He's like, you know what? I've been driving buses a long time. Mm-hmm. I think I'll do something different. Why not? Make, make some crazy beers. I dig it. Uh, I, I noticed this on their website, and I only write this down because both of us love baseball. Mm-hmm. Uh, they have a sour series there okay. at their brewery. You're going to love this name. It's called the Kirby Pucker Sour <laughs> Series. <laughs> That's pretty good. For those of you that oh, uh, don't know, Kirby Puckett was a great uh, Minnesota twin. Yeah, Hall of Famer, I think. Hall of he? Famer. Many years. Yeah. Uh, we'll see you tomorrow night, right? That was Kirby Puckett hitting the home run. That was. Wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Uh, R.I.P. Kirby. Yeah. yeah. Don't, don't, uh, no, that was Tony Gwynn that died from the chewing tobacco. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. St- an- another very good hitter, by the way. Um, yeah. Kirby Pucker Sour Series. They have 34 different sours in that. Dang. In that series. That's a lot. Which, I mean, Kirby Puckett was a pretty good hitter. I guess, you know, 34. Isn't that his number? Wasn't his number 34? Oh, maybe. We might need to check that. Maybe. Fact check. But that- I'm pretty sure his number was 34. Alexa, what number did Kirby Puckett wear? Let's see if Alexa knows. Here's something I found from the article Mike Pelfrey on Wikipedia. Mike Pelfrey. I didn't ask about Mike Pelfrey. In honor of the late Hall of Famer Kirby Puckett, Pelfrey was a... It was that. Boom. Thanks. All the time I spent looking at baseball cards in 1988. <laughs> Holy schmoly. <laughs> Look at that. And I'm not even a Twins fan. Man. If I would have got that wrong, Aaron Daly would have he spilled been my mad. beer on he purpose. He would have came in here and knocked it over. What number did uh, Ryan Sandberg wear? Uh, 23. Boom. Good job. All right. Anyway, so that's that's my research there on East Lake. Uh, I did a little more on Oliphant Brewing Company. Um, okay. Nothing on their website is normal. I would agree with you because I look because you told me so I went to look <laughs> at it and even the descriptions and like the blog posts. Um, awesome. I almost want to say it was like someone with a mild case, maybe not even a diagnosed case of schizophrenia. Mm-hmm. Type their website. It's. I don't know. It's bonkers is it the is, best way to it put is it. Awesome. Do you know what it reminds me of? Is um, Dolan is familiar with the band uh, People Mover. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. All right. They are crazy. If, are you okay. familiar with this band? People. It's Mover? an all Yeti band. Mm-hmm. I think. Yeah. I think yeah. he's made me listen to it before. I I love People Mover. I think they're great. But they dress like Yetis, uh, and they play they play metal music. Sure. And that's uh, not metal. But oh come on! <clears throat> it's definitely not metal. It's, it's not metal. No, it's um. It's polka. <laughs> that would be great. That um, would be. I don't even know what to call it. It's very electronic influence. There we go. Mm. I dig them. I think they're funny. Um, I like their music. It reminds me a lot of maybe their website a little bit. It's a little crazy. Twisted. Off the wall, like it's the, like yeah, absolutely. twisted sense of humor, I think, is yeah. what you need. And that's probably what's going on with this. Well, yeah, and they don't use any vowels. So that's true. That's <laughs> yeah. That's weird. Well, Yetis don't use really vowels either. I mean, they just grunt. I, yeah, they don't even use words, I guess. Right. Okay. Uh, so there, I had to go to Facebook for their location, 350 Main Street, Somerset, Wisconsin. Uh, on their website, it just says, we are located in downtown Somerset, Wisconsin, right off Main Street and Depot Street. They didn't even give you an address. It's just like, here you go. That was the most normal thing on the website, too. <laughs> yeah. And that, that's no joke. This was, I, I cut this out of the website and, and pasted this directly onto my notes here. Uh, this is on, as you scroll down through their website, we are not possessed by the devil. No, ma'am. We're possessed by the Oliphant. Mort and Treesus, Brewers and Acolytes, is Oliphant Brewing. We is Oliphant. We make beer. Let unreason reign. There you go. I love these guys. <laughs> I am because you are how. <laughs> wow. Uh, if you go to their Facebook description under businesses, like ours would say, like travel nurse agency uh-huh. or, or whatever, yeah. there says brewery dash pub dash religious place of worship. <laughs> wow. <laughs> to the beer, I hope. I well, don't who know. knows? I don't elephant? know. Elephant? <laughs> must be a elephant skull in uh, there or something. I don't know. I. It's better left unknown, I, I think. Though. Oh. I love it. It was me. I, my son just got home from school, and so it hit the... the Never mind. <laughs> Are you guys ready for this? Let's do it. So ready. There was there was a few different ways I could go. I thought Timothy Oliphant. Then I was sure. like, no, no. Then I was just uh, thinking, 
I looked up the terms Warren Elephant because that was the beer I was trying to figure out where they were from, and mm-hmm. I found that there was a lot of other beers that had that name. But then I thought, okay, well, that comes from somewhere, mm-hmm. so let's do some research. So this is actual research about elephants used in war. Oh. That was a real thing. Okay. Uh, they were mainly used to charge the enemy lines. So that we're talking like pre-cavalry days. Sure. This is like when they lined up with sticks and agreed to run at each <laughs> other and swing. That's how this warfare was, right? So if you could get yourself an elephant, you could just bowling ball down there and knock them over like pins and scare the hell out of them, and yeah. they might just run away. So a lot of people uh, use these things all around the world. Hmm. So that's what we got. Um, up until the mid 1800s, they were still used in actual combat in places like Thailand and Vietnam, which isn't that long ago. That's no. our civil. That's after our civil war. Yeah, they're fighting with elephants still. Hmm. Um, basically, what you had to do is you would get this guy, and his name was. Um, I wrote it down so I could say it correctly phonetically, a muhat, and it's spelled M A H O U T. And a muhat basically would be a boy that you would take in, like a rich family or a warlord family would get this kid, mm-hmm. and he would be paired with an elephant. And he would train this elephant for life. They never left. They were like a bonded pair. And he would train the elephant and teach it how to do stuff, and then that guy was in charge of the elephant. So wherever that elephant went, that guy would go. Hmm. So a lot of times... They would give these as gifts. This was like the most extravagant gift you could give another um, country or leader or ruler because they were so expensive and it took so long to get them. Like the prime age for them, they felt was, um, I think they said 60 years old. That was the best age as a, of a fighting elephant would be 60 years old. Mm-hmm. So you've lived with it and trained it and did all this stuff with it for 60 years and then it's, it's maximum value. And they only lived to like 80. Yeah, you would think by 60, they'd be like, yeah, screw this. Yeah, but go. they've like been through so much and they've trained them so well that by that point, they're just like the ultimate machine uh-huh. in the animal world. That and, means the dude would be like, the yes. dude would be like 70. Then. Old, yeah. And that's why they had to get them young. So they're old enough to understand how to do it. Sometimes they would train with like an older person that had done this before. Mm-hmm. And then they, would, then they would be paired with the elephant and they would go through life. So if they, if they gave away the elephant, then you got given away too. Whoa. You were just property, basically, is what oh. they were. <clears throat> Whoa. So, so if, the, if the Mongols came and invaded then, and they stole, they went, you just went with the elephant then? I mean, I guess. Yeah, or they'd kill you. Eh, okay. Um, but yeah, mostly they would take you. Because you didn't, mm. if you were in, in one of these battles and you were with, you didn't leave your elephant. Like you're on an elephant usually is if, how that would work. If the elephant dies in battle, do you die in battle too? I don't know. Hmm. I don't know. You might, maybe you have to. Weird. Maybe it's one of those things like like Aragon. Like if the dragon dies, you live. But if you die, the dragon dies. Maybe. I don't know. I don't think there's any free agency back then. So mm. it, probably, it probably was just you were done. Maybe you train the next kid coming up. Eh, maybe. So the oldest record of this was 4500 BC. Jeez. And this is, these were Asian elephants first that were used. So they're a little smaller than African elephants. And we're not talking about like a lot. I mean, they're... They're still stomp you to death, elephants. They're not like little babies. Huh. Um, we would say now, when I was telling you earlier that they thought they were their peak at 60, uh, we know now is with uh, science that uh, 25 to 40 is the peak age for an elephant to do work. Science. Science. Um, all of them that were used were male elephants because... They used to think it was because they would just be more mean and vicious and kill more people. Sure. Um, but it turns out, actually, um, females will run away from male elephants. So if you had females in your ranks and they were set to go against uh, mm-hmm. male elephants, they would just turn around and take off and stomp your own guys. Oh. And that's not good. You don't want to oh. lose your guys in the middle of the battle for that reason. So um, one of the things they used to do, and this was interesting, um, I think this was in India, the first time they had it put, um, depicted in any sort of writing or art was fifth century India. So we're talking what, like 500s ish AD. Mm-hmm. Um, they used them all the way up, they think in the BC time, but it was never documented until that. Um, they would basically take two people in uh, opposite factions and they would do an elephant joust to start the battle. So you're sitting on a thing and you got a big spear. And another guy's got one, and you just run at each other until somebody's dead. 
Jeez. And then when that's over, then the battle starts. <laughs> so that's pretty crazy. These rules are bad, right? Just, come on. Um, and that was, yeah, around that same time. Um, in 543 BC, they estimate there were six to 9,000 of these war elephants in the world being used. Can you imagine that? That's, wow. That's a lot. That's a lot. Alexander the Great, you heard of him? Yeah, yeah. I guess he was pretty good. Um, well, he was the great. That's what they say. Alexander there might not the, have been a lot of other Alexanders back then. The average? He might have been. Uh, he did beat a bunch of these elephants, an uh, uh, mm. uh, army that had some, about 85 or 100 of them. Wow. And he, and he took them. Well, so he said, hey, thank you for that, these. That seems pretty great. moving on. And so he took them from where they were. This is in a, uh, a lot of these encounters were happening when they were trying to expand their territories, mm-hmm. right, for their kingdoms or whatnot. Sure. Um, so then when he took those elephants, he took them back home, and he just used them to guard his castle. Oh. So he just had a big couple flanks of these elephants. You had to get through these elephants to get to him, which is pretty cool. That seems smart. And that was, yeah, BC-ish time frame, I think. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, the first time they were used in Europe was 318, and... One of Alexander's generals got some, and he and Alexander said, okay, I want you to go a little bit further west and south and take the land if you can. Here's some elephants, and that's what he did. Hmm. And he took 60 of them, and some of the people had never even seen or heard of an elephant, and they were just like, what? We give up. We know what's going on. That was another one of these big things is some people had never seen any of this stuff. Could you imagine just like a whole friggin' row of elephants coming at of you? like 500 of yes. them? Yes. Yeah. So these elephants would have, a lot of times they would have swords attached to their tusks oh. or knives attached to their feet. What? Um, <laughs> what? Anything that they could do to make, like, if you were coming at them, especially another elephant, to, like, do some damage on them. Like, they were meant to do that. Like tusk bayonets? Yeah. Basically. Weird. Bas- or like, yeah, basically a tusk like the, bayonet. Like the tusk wasn't mean enough. Yes. You had to wrap a sword around it. You have to it. put a sword on it. Crazy. Um, Pliny the Elder, remember him? I do. He wrote about him. Oh. He wrote about war elephants back in the day. Romans used them to take over and fight Greece. So when they took over that, then they used a bunch of their war elephants. And that's how that took place. Um, in the 15th century, they started to kind of dwindle off because gunpowder was created mm. and they said that an elephant could withstand a lot of musket shots mm-hmm. but a cannonball could take it out yep so they started to be not on the front line so much anymore and they kind of were pushed back to the end of the battle lines i mm-hmm. guess you could say except in asia like i said before they were still being used up until the 18 something sure um then after they figured out how to make better rifles and stuff they made these things called jingles, and not Christmassy, mm-hmm. J-I-N-G-A-L-S, and it's basically a big gun that they would mount on top of the elephant. <laughs> and these things looked like they were 12 feet long, and oh. you'd have, it was one of those you'd got one shot, basically, right? Sure. It was going to take forever, to, two or three dudes to reload the gun. Yeah. But you're on top of an elephant, and then you're just blasting this big gun. And that's what they used all the way up until 1893. Wouldn't that scare the elephant, you think? Well, that's why the training comes in. Oh. Probably the first time or 100 times, probably. Give him a haircut. Um, Up until World War II, they were in use in the military in certain ways. Um, They could go places that vehicles couldn't go, especially in the jungles. Mm -hmm. Uh, Anything that was wet and muddy. Mostly they were used to carry supplies or move other machinery. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, dragging stuff, pulling things. They weren't actually used in battle, but they were being used so for the military. Of, a beast of burden, so Basically, to speak. Basically, yeah, right, like okay. a Rolling Stones track. Mm-hmm. Um, up until, I think this was, let's see, 2004, they were still listed in the United States um, Army Special Forces Field Manual. And that would be something that was in their like inventory. They were still listed as a pack animal or a, a working animal. So... 15 years ago, we were still saying that we had them in our rotation. Huh. Huh. Okay. But the last time they were really used that anybody can figure out was in Baghdad in 1987. Hmm. Except for, and I found this the other day, this was crazy. Um, the KIA, the Kachin Independence Army. And this is in the mountains of Myanmar. Okay. And there's about 10,000 people that live in this area. And it's basically... Mountains that are full of gold mines and timber reserves 
and um, jade. So expensive materials, right? Yep. Right. So they've basically split off from Myanmar, and they said, this is our stuff. They're like pirates, basically. Yeah. And they said, you want to come get it, then you come and get it. And these are the only people in the world that are still using elephants in the military. So they'll, they have guys right around. I think mm-hmm. they said they had about 48 or 50 of these elephants still. Hmm. And they're up in the mountains, and they ride around and, and keep the actual military away and anybody that's trying to poach or steal their gold stuff and jade and mm-hmm. all that. So they just, like, walk around the jungles with these elephants and blast people that they find. That's pretty badass, actually. That's kind of what I thought. Yeah. So then I dug a little deeper, and I thought, okay, where have I seen these? Because I feel like that's something you see sometimes. In, yeah. And depending on the sort of uh, media you take in, mm-hmm. um, they're really big, as far as legacy goes, Japan, India, that sort of area. Like, that's just something, because they've, people have been there for so much longer than we, you know, here. Mm-hmm. Um, so they're kind of all over in their stories and their artwork and things. Um, they used to make elephant armor, like actual armor, like chain mail and other things. Yeah. And it would take, especially in Japan, it would take like five or six dudes a long time to make one set of armor for an elephant. Jeez. But they did, mostly for show and decoration and also just to scare the other people. Yeah. You'll see these in video games. So I wrote down a few games that have elephants of war in them. Okay. And then uh, see if you know about any of these. Right. But Age of Empires. Heard of it. Celtic Kings. Assassin's Creed Origins. Mm-hmm. And then it was in some movies. Lord of the Rings. Yes. And Game of Thrones you have not seen. But there's no. badass elephants in Game of Thrones. Hmm. Interesting. Um, let's see. Yeah, now they're just used to carry stuff around and patrol that one mountain area. Hmm. And that is what I know about war elephants. Wow. I wasn't expecting to uh, find so much. Right. Like I really had to boil it down to keep it timely today because there was like every age, Iron Age, um, every different group that you've heard of in history, Mesopotamia, and Japan, India, um, England, everybody used them. Greece, hmm. Rome. They all had elephants. They were all using them for for war and uh, mostly just to scare people. That seems to be the idea was just to strike fear into people. It's pretty scary. Yeah. I mean, it, I mean that that hasn't that idea hasn't changed in war really. Right. I mean, that was the whole reason even for like, you know, the bomb in Hiroshima basically to scare the people into into surrendering and it worked. So yeah, I guess so. Scaring people is, is something that they do. Mm. So that's what I got for that. Uh, okay, so I drank it. I don't know if I would order it again. I would. I would. I didn't drink any for a long time because I was babbling. Mm-hmm. And when I went back to it, I was like, ooh, this is so good. You know, it's like uh, I forgot I had it. You know what it kind of reminds me of? Kind of, kind of. What? That pickle beer? Exactly. I knew, <gasps> I knew you were going to say that because I got it? it too. Yeah. It has that, that little pickle briny bite on your tongue. Yeah. Maybe that's why I like it so much. Could be. And one of my go-to beers is a Goza. So it's not that I don't like mm-hmm. the style. So what is it? The smoke? Maybe. I don't get any chocolate. Let's just be real. Like there's... Mm-mm. No. I don't taste any chocolate in this thing at all. No. It's mostly smoke, a little bit of pepper, and salt. Yeah, I don't... But I'm okay with that. I don't get that. Yeah, I don't get it. I don't know if I would want the chocolate. I guess chocolate and chilies mm, goes together. It does. Right? I mean, that's a mole yeah. sauce, right? Yeah. Yep. Don't yep. shake his head. Yeah. But I don't, I don't know if I would want to taste it in mm. this. I guess if it wasn't sweet. More sweet. You know what I mean? <clears throat> right. It's like dark chocolate. A mole beer. They have those. I've seen really? had them before. Yeah. Ooh. I I can only imagine these guys like sitting around and I don't I think I think Sheila went to East Lake because the pictures that she sent at one point look very similar to what the website looks like. Okay. Could you imagine these two different like the two brewers sitting around and be like, Okay, we're gonna we're gonna do mm-hmm. a collab, right? Yeah. What are we gonna do? And East Lake, the more normal so I would let's make a goza. Let's make a goza. Yeah. All right, let's make a goza, but let's put uh chili and yeah. and chocolate in it. All right. And yeah. oh and let's and let's smoke it too. See, that's the key. The smoked part of it. Cuz the chili chocolate thing I've seen before. I've had before, but not smoked. Mm-mm. I've never had a smoked goza. Mm. No. That's really good. It's really I good. I think I think it's great. I like it a lot. But I wouldn't want you I'm kind of like you though. I wouldn't want to do it a lot. No. But every once in a while I think mm-hmm. it'd be fun. I think on the level of weird beers that we've had, this ranks right up there. This, I mean, yeah. 
This is like top three, maybe, of it's, the weirdest combinations. I like it. It's weird as, as it's as weird as the pickle beer, mm-hmm. but this is for me more enjoyable. And I don't then I don't mean weird in a bad way whatsoever. Yeah, I just think this off, is the, off the normal. Yeah. Let's try to do something crazy. This is why people m- make beer. Mm-hmm. For most most of the brewers that, that are around in this area, at least, mm-hmm. aren't in it to just make the same thing every time. And right. I guarantee you that this, what is it called? Psycho what? What's the what's the other brewery? Oliphant? Oliphant. I guarantee you they don't make much normal beer. No. Oh, look at their website. There are some fantastic beers on there. They oh had my some gosh. cool shirts, by the way. Oh. I was looking for a hat because, you know, I'm a hat sucker. Yep. And I couldn't. they didn't have any, but they had some cool t-shirts. Crazy. Yeah. All right. So we, we kind of teased the untapped already. Let's, let's, uh, what well, was like, what, 50, 60 65 check ins? Dude, I think this could be, I mean, there's hardly any check in. So either people are really going to like it or they're really not going to like it. Mm-hmm. I say four, three. Four, three. I'm going to go 3.64. 3.67. Wow. Dude. Dang. That's close. I'm just thinking, you know, I I'd rate it around a four two five. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think so. But yeah, I, yeah, I don't I, know. I guess it's just a matter of who ordered the beer. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I, right. Like if it was somebody that was really into this, and that was mm-hmm. the reason they went that day, they're probably going to go high. More unique than we've ever like one mm-hmm. of the more unique beers we've ever had here. I just I don't know. I maybe we'll have to save a little bit for Aaron mm-hmm. and see if he can get some of the chocolate out of this thing because I can't. I just cannot find it. I don't. I think it might be a combination with the pepper. Like, I think chilies and pepper go so well together. That's, that yeah. You think it's masking the other? Masking the other. Because it doesn't, it's not spicy at all. No. no. And that's what I was going to look up is it's, so it said these chilies, mm-hmm. these, how, how was this stolen? Guajillo. Guajillo. Guajillo chilies are 2,500 to 6,000 scovels, which. That's mm, a lot better than a jalapeno. Is that hot? Yeah. I mean. Oh. Well, it's like. Three times as hot as a jalapeno. I would think that's kind of hot. I get no heat at all out of it. I'm going to take the season. Well, like the hottest wing at Buffalo Wild Wings is a million, right? right. Is it a million or a hundred thousand? I can't remember. I don't don't know. know. Yeah, me either. But so put that into perspective. Yeah, it's it's not that hot. But shouldn't you get a little bit of heat? A little? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe they don't want you to have a little heat. And you know what? Maybe it's like a jalapeno, like... Yeah, we can say jalapenos at whatever Scoville, but mm-hmm. to be honest, that might be one out of the 20 you get on yeah. the pepper plant. I so. mean, there's sometimes, I we are a big fajita household, mm-hmm. and I buy a lot of jalapenos, and there'll be certain times that I'll I'll put a couple in, and I'll think I put five or six in there. You're like, yeah. holy shit, there's only one pepper in here. Yeah. Why is it so hot? I took the seeds out. Yeah. You know, and then there's another time you can eat five or six, and there's no problem. So it's just a matter right. of the pepper it's, itself, but... And see, my mom always told me, like, the pepper with the most specks on it is going to be the hottest. Mm. I just, I don't think it's true. It's, it's just an old wives' s- tale. Super random. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. It's like the old wives' tale. If you, you plant some uh, matches under the plant or whatever, it makes them hotter or whatever. Oh, have you the ever pepper? Heard yeah. No, I've never heard that. You never heard this? No. Yeah, if you plant, like, remember old matchbooks? You get a matchbook. Oh, book, yeah. You bury it in the ground. You plant it with the seed. And it's supposedly it's supposed to make it hotter because it's fire. <sighs> <laughs> that sounds like a, just a bad dad joke. Could be. Braden told that joke. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that sounds about his speed. Yeah, I'm not getting any heat out of it at all. No. Well, maybe a little bit on your tongue, maybe. I definitely but, do taste the pepper, though. It's it's there. And it's good. For sure. I love an Anaheim in a beer because it's not too hot. Mm-hmm. It tastes like a pepper. You, get, you know mm-hmm. what you're getting. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's just... I, that's one of my favorite styles. Mm. Uh, you ready for bonus beer? Yeah, bonus beer. All right, we'll do a bonus beer, and then I have some more research for this beer okay. as well. And I have some bonus beer research, so oh, let's get great. into that. Okay. I'll let you open this so I can right. turn over. So, uh, you know what? I've had this. I've had this. Uh, I've never had this style or this one before. That brewery? But I do. Is it Distille? I, I think it's pronounced Distille, yes. Distille. So, they are out of Illinois. Mm-hmm. They started out as just a little brew pub, so like a Laszlo's here in, in Omaha. Mm-hmm. Um, in 2007, they opened their first one in Normal, Illinois, mm-hmm. which is a Ben <laughs> Folds song also. Mm-hmm. Um, 1123 of 2007. Four years later, they opened a second location in Champaign, Illinois, mm-hmm. um, on 420, 2011. Whoa. And yeah, so they sold beer. They had a great thing. Uh, then the 
economy kind of took a, a hit around that 2007 time frame, I think. Yep. And then uh, everybody else was doing bad, but they were doing good. And a lot of um, people around that area were calling for them to can their beer because it was just a little restaurant. Hmm. They had really good food and they had good beer, but you couldn't go to the store and buy this. You just had to go to the place. Interesting. So they said, okay, well, let's make a brewery. We're going to actually can beer. So that started in 2013. Um, by 2015, they were like, we need a bigger space. Hmm. By 2016, that one was open. And then like six months after that, they said, we need another space. Jeez. So that one opened in 2017. So now I think from what I can understand, it was a little unclear on their website. They either have two breweries that are canning or they just dump the one they, they opened in 16 and went to a bigger one in 17, oh. which doesn't make sense financially to me, but hey, you know what? I don't run a brewery. Never so, know. Yeah. Um, in this series, there are 12 different sours mm -hmm. that they make. And the, one of them, I think it's called Psycho something, kind of along the line of that thing. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the a, green can. Yeah. It's just one of the most sour beers in a can I've ever had in my life. Uh, yes. I had it at a beer, like an extreme beer fest. And that thing was so good. So sour. Oh, yeah. You could hardly drink it. It like, was so sour. Like licking a 9-volt battery. Yeah. It was, it's crazy sour. And I think that might have been, yeah, it was, there was, yeah, there's, there's a number of them in this series that I've had. And that, by far, that one's the most sour. The other ones, they make some really good sours. So this is one, they make four of them in this, like, seasonal series and mm -hmm. this is the fall winter seasonal because it's cranberry mm -hmm. cranberry um but it's five percent 17 ibus it's basically brewed with cranberries and sweet cherries so oh that's delicious mm. we'll let dolan be the judge of that mm. Mm. tastes like winter um let's see they have um i also wrote this down let's see where's my numbers do 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 do, do. you really get a lot of cranberry out of that a lot. They have uh, an IPA series that they call the Deadhead series, mm. and one of them is called Funkin' Groovin'. <laughs> and that's pretty great. Yes. Um, they have seven core beers. So they have like an IPA, they have a milk stout, um, like a wit or wheat beer, that sort of stuff, you know, sure. the normals. Mm -hmm. And one of them is a Russian stout that's called... Like a Russian Imperial? Like yes. A, like and a... it's just called Privyet, P-R-I-V-Y-E-T. And I've had that one. It's really good. It's about 10%. Then they have a barrel-aged version. They have three different ways. So just a barrel-aged Russian Imperial. Then they have one that has rye. It's aged in rye barrels. And then they have one that's been aged in rye barrels. It has vanilla added. And those are called... Oh man, I, I can't speak Russian. Dolan. Dos Vidanya. Dos Vidanya. There you go. Dos Vidanya means good morning. That's... Uh, mm. Or good night. I'm going to guess good night. Good because night. these beers would put you out. Okay, They're there you like go. 13, 14, 15%. And they have those every once in a while you'll get one here. But they didn't have a lot of distribution to Nebraska uh, for those. Those are really like mm. rare to find. Privyet means hello. So I, sh hello I should have remembered this you go. from my, my, my hello, Russia days. good night. Yeah. Good night. So that's, that's uh, this brewery hmm. in a nutshell. But I brought that just because I knew we were kind of doing some sort of tart, or tart and sour sort of beer. And I thought maybe it would go hmm. good with it. Dosvidaniya. Dosvidaniya means goodbye or bye-bye in Russian. There you go. Yes. Goodbye, dosvidaniya. I do remember that. I remember that from my, mm. from my days. That is good. Isn't it cranberry yummy? It's like a, a little tart and puckery, but not too bad. Mm. It'd be very uh, entry level, you know? Yeah. It reminds me of the um, Sprite Cranberry. Oh, nice. Oh, a little bit, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you like Sprite Cranberry, you mm -hmm. might like this beer. It's like an alcoholic Sprite Cranberry. Yeah, who doesn't? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I was looking, I was trying to find out, you know, something uh, a little less on topic for research, mm -hmm. but still tangibly related sure. to some sort of elephant theme. Uh, and then, you know me, if I can find a music tie-in, I'm yeah. going to. All right. And I did. Okay. And I'm excited for this one. This is like, oh man, this opened uh, a lot of doors of things I didn't know. And I have purposefully saved two browser tabs to send to you guys after this because I didn't want you to spoil it. But I was like, I can't lose these things either. Awesome. So um, a pachyderm is a term that you'll hear tied with elephants. It's like a large land animal. Um, so I looked that up because I wanted to see what that was. I remember that from Bugs Bunny days. There you go. Pachyderm. Pachyderm. Mm -hmm. A hippo is a pachyderm. Did you know that? I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, anywho, pachyderm studios. Cannon Falls, Minnesota. It's a recording mm -hmm. studio. Okay. 
And I thought, ooh, that's neat. Let me look into that. Which I, is I interesting know, because like, East Lake is in Minnesota. Minnesota. So oh. there's our first tie, Minnesota. Mm. Um, it's 35 miles from the Twin Cities and, and their airport. So okay. you could fly in and then be there within about a half an hour. It's a secluded, basically, house studio. So when you go record your album there, you're living in this house. You don't go to the hotel. You don't do whatever. Interesting. You're, you're there for good. You can go into town. There's a town there. Um, oh, it's called Cannon Falls. And Aaron, I was talking to Aaron Daly about it. Mm-hmm. And he said he's been through there. Um, now there's about 4,000 people. But when the house was built in the 60s, it was about 1,800. So it's still a small town. Yeah. Um, the console, the recording console that they have there is a NEV, N-E-V-E. And that's an analog recording mm-hmm. console. Um, it's an 8068. And it's the same one. That came out of um, Electric Ladyland Studios in New York City, which is Jimi Hendrix's studios. Oh, so okay. Jimi Hendrix's albums were recorded on this console. And when it was up for sale, these people bought it. This and is the same this console. This is the console. That's legit. Right? Yes. So here's some of the bands that have recorded there in the last, I would say, 10 years. Okay. And then I saved the good ones for later. Mm. So a lot of these are ones like kind of local Minnesota acts or bands that I like and follow. Mm-hmm. And then the other ones will be more like, holy shit, I didn't realize that. Yeah. So Trample by Turtles, know them? Mm-hmm. No. no. They are a bluegrass band. They're probably one of Minnesota's biggest exports right now as far as music across the United States. They play here a lot, and they are super fun if you ever get a chance to see them. They play here in Omaha, like oh, Midwest? Yeah. Okay. I've seen them probably seven times. Trample by Turtles. Trample by Turtles. It's kind of funny, right? Yeah. Because it would be hard to get. Don, you familiar with these guys? No, I'm not. I'm not. I, uh, we discovered this the other day. I'm not very um, much into the Americana, bluegrass yeah. folk as as Brian is. I'm gonna work on them. Okay. Um, the guy from the band that's the lead singer and main songwriter has a side project. It's called Dead Man Winter. It's a little more experimental, a little fuzzier guitar. It's a little yeah. harder. Okay. Um, they've recorded there. A band called Golden Smog. Brian Setzer and his orchestra. I know that name. How about Super Chunk? I've heard of Super Chunk. They're from North Carolina. They're oh, like cool. merge records from the 90s all the way up to now. Super Tramp? No, not Super <laughs> Tramp, thankfully. How about the Breeders? You know about them? Oh, yeah. They were there and recorded in the 90s. Yeah. They might be giants. Oh, yes. I've heard of them. How yeah. about uh, Sone Volt? Sun Volt? Yeah. Yeah, I love those guys. And then this one I wrote down. I follow her. I found her on YouTube a couple years ago. Her name... Well, she plays under the name Reina Del Cid. I saw her and uh, another, it was like another duo um, here in Omaha at a coffee shop in downtown Omaha this summer. She just happened to be like, they're on a tour of Midwest. Hmm. And that was the only time I've ever been to this place. I've never been well? back. At the well? Sozo? Yeah, was, Sozo? Yeah. Love that yeah. place. I'm going there tomorrow. Hmm. It was a th- I, when I got tickets, I was like, "Where is this place?" And my friend John that I went with, he was like, oh, "This down, yeah, I'll show you where it's at." Hmm. So she played there, but she recorded her out al- her most recent album there. Um, now we're gonna get to the big ones here. I'm gonna tell you this album title. I'll give you a couple seconds, and then I'll tell you who it is. Okay. Um, these are probably targeted more for you. Uh, so I'm getting the album title. I got to give you the band yeah. name. Yeah. Okay. And then if Dolan knows, he can chime in. Too. Interesting. Right. Uh, Grave, I won't know. Grave Dancers Union. I want to say it's not, it's Soul Asylum. You're right. Yes. Ding, ding, ding. Um, this one is called Hollywood Town Hall. Uh, I'm, oh, my gosh. You're talking about one of my favorite bands of all time. I know. This is the Jayhawks. Yes. Now oh, do you see why I was excited? Get out of here. The Jayhawks recorded here. Um, this album was called Rid of Me. It came out in 1994, I believe. Mm, no. British songstress PJ Harvey. Oh, yeah. Um, this one, Throwing Copper. Uh, that would be live. That's right. Also live 94. recorded here. Yeah, throwing copper recorded here. Wow. Um, I don't know this band, but I wrote it down because it was popular. I guess from here to infirmary, alkaline mm. trio. Alkaline trio. Yeah. Weren't they a little? They were a little more experimental. I think maybe at the time. Maybe the only band that I know from this list is live. <laughs> How about? Oh this my gosh! One? If you haven't heard the Jayhawks, you got to do that. Okay. Now here's the thing: it is maybe a, Jayhawks are a little more bluegrassy, folksy kind of. They're country adjacent, almost. Almost. Okay. Um, Panic stations. No. Hmm. Motion City soundtrack. That's hmm. a Jamie band. That's an emo. Hmm. She'll be all over that one. Okay. Emo night. Yeah. Uh, how about this one? Fontanelle. That's no. the name of our forest here. Mm-hmm. Also, name of a '90s 
album by Babes in Toyland. Oh yeah, so some of the Riot Girls. Wasn't Babes in Toyland? Wouldn't aren't they more? I would say that was more hair metal. Maybe it's probably on the edge. Okay, it's coming out of the late eighties to nineties. Hair metal adjacent. Here is the biggest. Here's the biggest <laughs> one. There you go. I would say the Jayhawks are the biggest, but that's no. okay. In okay. freaking utero. Get out of here. Nirvana's last really? studio album. What? So Steve Albini, their producer from Chicago, was brought up and did the sessions at this house. What? So that was part of the thing. I was like, holy cow, I cannot believe this. Um, there are, the article I was reading showed that there was, basically they said there was one picture from the studio that they knew of, of Nirvana being there. Yeah. And I found it. So I'm going to send it to you guys after this. Yeah. Because it's really cool. It's got Francis in it. The ba- She's a little baby. And she's a baby, yeah. And they're all sitting in front of this fireplace. And uh, then there's another picture I found, too. That's pretty funny. So Dave, Chris, and and and, uh, mm-hmm. and Kurt. And then Steve Albini's in the photo, too. Weird. Um, so and then I was going to give you just a little story of the house and the history of it, too. Because I thought it was really cool. But yeah. it's also in the articles that I'll send you guys. But basically, this guy, um, Don Mensing wanted to his like dream was to build this house in the middle of a forest by a creek and uh, used an architect to do that in like 1962 so it was very modern tech technology back then mm-hmm. design um, so it's like mid-century modern now mm-hmm. um, so that's 50 some years ago lived in the house for almost 30 years when he died um, a engineer from Minneapolis a sound engineer bought the house turned it into a studio like I guess early 90s Okay. Um, used it for a while. After the kind of grunge boom, mm-hmm. kind of they tapered off. They didn't book sessions. They didn't do as okay. well, and uh, went into foreclosure. Oh. Then it went into like ruin, and then finally another guy bought the house. I think his name. Let me see here. Oh, the guy that bought the studio the first time. His name was Jim Nickel, and he was in a band called Mean Old Elephant. So hence the Pachyderm Studios, I guess. Oh. And when they built the studio, because the studio wasn't there at the house. It was just the house. He built the house, had an area for a studio. He built the studio. And if you look at it from the air, the studio looks like an elephant's head. There's like two ears and then a long section and then it looks like a trunk. Huh. So that's the reason for the name. Um, and then that guy died and then it went into ruin. The current owners bought it um, and then started booking bands to just record because the yeah. house was trashed they had like squatters living in it and a tree had fallen through the roof and like it was trashed and it took almost four years for him to get it back to what it was yeah but the other reason it took so long was because they used period um piece so like 60s material so the okay. carpet the flooring the wall tiles the everything light fixtures it's all from the 60s wow. and it looks like it the picture you're going to see from the Nirvana days mm-hmm. is exactly what it looks like right now versus what it looked like in the 60s. It's the no. same, but it took so long. So now if you go there and record, you can stay in the house. It took them about, yeah, about four years before they could do that. Um, one of the articles I read said, like, the people in the town know when someone's in recording because there'll be somebody will show up and be sitting in your bar stool because <laughs> the, so, the town's so small, you have your own <laughs> spot. So when someone shows up that's not from town... They don't know. Like just John Mayer's chilling yeah. at the bar yep. or whatever. And they're like, oh, well, yeah, you're not from here. You're sitting in my you're right. sitting in my seat. So that's what I know about Pachyderm Studios. So if you, uh, this is, I, oh, man. My friend Travis Powers, our friend mm-hmm. Travis Powers, introduced me, to the, introduced me to the Jayhawks. Yeah, that sounds about years right. Years ago. Years ago. And yeah. that, okay, how about this? I remember when Hollywood Town Hall came out, and I really, really liked, um, uh, one of the songs off it mm-hmm. didn't really go any further than that, and I didn't. I I let it go for a while. I bought this. I bought the. I want to say CD. It was probably the tape. Nice. Um, and it didn't. It didn't really go further than that. Anyway, so this was probably. I don't even know how many years ago. Ten ish years yeah. ago, whatever. When Travis and I worked together, uh, I, it, it came up in a conversation at one point, and probably because of the Jayhawks basketball, whatever. You yeah. Know, or whatever. He's like, oh my gosh, there's so many more yeah. to the, to their you know to their number of albums or whatever. I love that. I think it's called Rainy Day Music, maybe oh, 2004. Yeah. That's my yes. favorite. Tomorrow the Green Grass was right after Hollywood Town mm-hmm. Hall, and just great. And some of the guys did they did their own like they, they went out and recorded their own stuff yeah. and yeah. and stuff, which is yeah, I, I like them better as the Jayhawks. Sure. I, I appreciated their own you know their their 
solo stuff. But if you if you look up their Wikipedia page for Hollywood Town Hall, mm-hmm. released September fifteenth, nineteen ninety two, recorded at Hollywood Studio and Pecky Durham Studio. There you go. There it is. Last tie into this, why it matters in our podcast. The guy that built the building, Don Mensing, mm-hmm. he the money he, that he had from that was because he owned a malt factory for beer. So oh. he was a malt maker, and that's where he got his money to it, build this. It all comes back around to beer. It always does. Gosh. So that's what I got. Who would have ever thought we would have got to Not me. Hollywood when I found Town that Hall. Nirvana tie-in and all that stuff. I was so stoked. I'm telling you, if you like, I kind of like, this is, it says alternative country. That's a good, that's what they called it in the 90s. Yeah, I would think so, but they were playing this on MTV. So, yeah. I mean, that's. I, that I was mean, the 90s. The 90s had yeah. all sorts of genres in it. So if you if you like, uh, who am I thinking of? The Black Keys? No. Mm. No? They're not really all country. There's no pedal steel in that mm. when there is the Jayhawks. How about the uh, uh, Mumford and Son? Yeah, that's cl- yeah. Mumford and Son's closer, maybe. Um, yeah, early Mumford and Son, I mm-hmm. would say. That's. I think that's if you if you appreciate that style. Yeah, I'm not a Black Keys fan whatsoever, so I guess maybe I'm yeah. off on that. But yeah, if you appreciate Mumford and Son, then then even something like the Rankin Tours is close. I don't know if I've ever heard that's them. That's Jack White's other uh, oh. countryish band. They got pedal steel and some banjo once in a while. So interesting. Yeah, if you like that at all, please check out the Jayhawks. They are Yeah. Good. It seems like the studio early on was grunge rockers and then more recently it's like folk rockers and mm-hmm. alt country people. And that's that's super okay cool. with me. That's crazy that we got back around to that. Yeah. So all because of beer. Always because of beer. <laughs> at least when I'm involved. <laughs> I I was gonna end it with uh let unreason rain. Because yeah. that uh, that was on on their website, but it sounds good. I can't help but end it the way we always do. Okay, we're not going anywhere for a while. Let's have another beer. Thank you for listening to A Beer with Atlas. Special thanks to our brand team for producing the show. Each episode of A Beer with Atlas is powered by Atlas Medstaff, an industry leader in travel healthcare staffing.